Good morning. This morning's scripture is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, and verses 11 to 16 on page number 977 and 978 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verses 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here today. Welcome to Foothill Church. I'm Pastor Chris, one of the pastors here. And we're just, uh, we're super excited to have you with us. Uh, well, it might strike some of you as, as funny, but uh, there was a point in my junior high years that I actually thought I wanted to play football. Um, I was taller than everybody else. I was moderately fast, and so I thought, hey, maybe I'd make a good wide receiver or lineman or something like that. And uh, so I, I decided, that was back in the day, maybe some of you remember, California it used to be, that uh, the junior high went seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And uh, so between my eighth and ninth grade year was football tryouts. And so um, I was prepared. I mean, all my friends were going to do it. So I'm like, okay, I'll go try out for the football team and had it on my calendar. I remember getting up that morning that football tri tryouts were supposed to happen in, in August. And uh, getting dressed, and it was early in the morning, and I went, and I kind of walked out to the curb in front of my house, and I sat there, and I thought to myself, and I'm like, you know, I have had a great summer, a lot of swimming, a lot of times with friends and whatever. Nah, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and I kind of just said, it just, you know, it's too hot outside, I don't really feel like being a football player, and I'm done. So I went back in the house and had a great summer. And uh, uh, my epic football career ended before it ever began. Um, now, now, I think what it was, I looked at it and I said, I, I, I don't want to do what it takes. I don't want to work that hard. That, that just seems whatever. And um, I, I think all of us have something in our lives that I think we, we want. We kind of want it out there. But when it came down or comes down to it, we're not willing to do what it takes to get that something, right? It's like, oh, it's too hard. The willpower isn't there. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. And, and I think in our spiritual lives, things are no different. So, so I think many of us really want to be spiritually mature men and women of God. I really believe this. I think there's a lot of you that you come to church and, and you like the religion thing or Christianity, whatever you think it is. And, and, and for some of you, you really do have a, a relationship with Jesus and you want to have this live, vibrant relationship. And yet somehow it, it feels like it's kind of fleeting and you never really get traction and you, you, you can't seem to get it off the ground and it feels, you know, wimpy and it doesn't really go where you want it to go. And so sometimes I think we just go, you know, well, it's just too hard because your understanding of of Christianity is that, you know, when it comes down to it, I don't want to work that hard. My spirit is willing, my flesh is weak. So we end up thinking that our spiritual lives are all about trying harder, that the way to get a, a great spiritual life is you got to go, you know, to two-a-days, and you got to work really hard, and, 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 and you know, it's going to be blood, sweat, and tears and all that. And maybe it's because uh, the reason for that is that we, we look in Scripture or we hear from culture of what it means to be a Christian, and there's all of these commands. There's all these things that I'm told I should do and shouldn't do, must do, must not do. 
And let's face it, you look in Scripture and you can see them pretty easily. And, 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 and I think some of the commands of Scripture are, are, you know, we look at them and go, okay, those seem reasonable, right? Like, don't murder. All right, haven't done that. That's good. I can do that one, right? Uh, don't lie. Okay, uh, don't have sex with your neighbor's wife. All right, I won't. You know, I mean, you can, you can go, all right, I, I think I can handle many of these. But then there's this whole other uh, part of, of, of the commands of Scripture that seem impossible. I mean, completely out of your league. Like, like love your enemies. That's why they're enemies. I hate them, right? Um, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, be content. Have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus. <laughs> or, or my favorite one, God himself says, be holy as I am holy. Well, okay, right? How do I do this? And so you hear these things and you're like, that, that doesn't even seem possible. And, 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 and so trying harder, how do I try harder to have an attitude that I don't have? How do I try harder to be something that I'm not? How do I try harder to stuff the spirit down inside of me, whatever that looks like, right? And so we think, well, this really is kind of spiritual pie in the sky, pious mumbo jumbo, and I just kind of skip over it. See, here's the thing. The Bible, as you read it, is filled with imperatives. You understand what I mean by that? Like an imperative is do this, don't do that, right? It's filled. I mean, there you can't, you can't hardly read a book of the Bible that doesn't have some kind of command or imperative that you're supposed to do or not do. I mean, think of this. Jesus, his last words before he, uh, you know, ascends to the Father, he says, guys, one more thing, Matthew 28. Uh, I want you to go out and I want you to make disciples. Okay, so what's a disciple? He says, there are people who are baptized. And that one seems honestly fairly easy, right? We're going to have a baptism in a couple of weeks. And you know what it means? It means you believe in Jesus, you get dunked under the water. I mean, that, that one seems, okay, did it, you know, check. But then he says, baptizing them and, and, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Now that is a ridiculously high standard. Everything Jesus commanded, that's what it means to be a disciple. This is a massive, massive requirement. Now, so that's how most of us understand Christianity. It ends up being a list. It ends up being a burden. It ends up being try harder, do more. Uh, and, and every day I feel defeated because let's face it, the commands of Scripture are the easiest to understand, right? They just sort of pop off the page at you. Right, do this, don't do that, be this way, whatever. And it's so easy as a preacher, and so you'll hear a lot of preachers. It's real easy. Let's just talk about the commands of Scripture. Let's preach on the Ten Commandments. Let's do whatever. We can, we can talk about them, and they're pretty easy. They kind of sit up there, and, 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 and we can tell you what it means. But here's what you need to know. You don't start there. The Bible will not start with the commands of God. Okay? Because before you get to the imperatives of Scripture, the Bible's first going to give you the indicatives of Scripture. Now, you know what that means? It means the before the Bible tells you what to do or not do, it's going to tell you who you are or are not. It's going to tell you what Christ has done. So before the, the Bible ever gives you the law, it gives you the gospel. And this is true Old and New Testament. Now, I'm telling you this for a couple of reasons. Maybe the, the least and the minor reason is, is that it's going to help you understand as you read your Bible. So you go to the Old Testament and you'll realize that there's all these commands in the Old Testament and yet you, you notice something, that God does not give one command until after he calls his people out. I rescued you, right? I brought you out of the land of slavery. You're mine, you're my people. And over and over in the commands of Scripture and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and other ways, he's going to give these long commands and he's going to end it with, I'm the Lord your God. I just want to remind you, remember, keep that, keep that up here. Don't, don't let that be something you just you suppress. And otherwise, this is just going to become rules and regulations. You do this because I'm, I'm your God. I rescued you. I protected you. I helped you. I mean, you'll see the same thing in the Gospels, right? Jesus will, will not tell his disciples to do one thing until he first calls them. You're mine. Okay, now let's talk about what you should do. You'll see this in the writings of Paul. 
So, I mean, you can pretty much split Paul's writings in half, and the first half is going to be all about what Christ has done, and the second half is going to basically be all about how we should live in light of what Christ has done. Okay, now, I'm not telling you that just because I want you to read your Bibles better. I'm telling you this because most of us, I believe most people live under the weight of the law because they skim over the gospel, Uh, Most of us obsess over what we must do and must not do, and we spend almost no time obsessing over what Christ has done for us. See, see, we, we, we think about what does it mean for me to behave better today rather than believe better today. And and, and tell me that's not our problem, right? I mean, tell me that's why most of us feel defeated, Because this is the weight that we carry around. It's why most of us sit on the curb of our spiritual maturity and just go, nah, too difficult, don't want to do it, can't do it. Because the very thing that was meant to give you power and encouragement is the very thing we skim over. The very thing that is meant to weaken your flesh and make you get off the curb and strengthen your spirit is the thing that we don't focus enough on. Now, I don't want to do that to you today, okay? I've got an imperative for you, okay? There's a command. (laughs) I'm going to show you a few of them, but I, I don't want to start there, okay? There's something I want you to do, something I think you need to do if you really have a desire to grow up to be a mature person of God, Okay, I believe this with all my heart, but I don't want to start there. And I don't want to, I don't want to start with what you, with you, I, I want to start with Jesus. I don't want to start with what you have to do, I want to start with what Jesus has done. Okay, so, I had Katie read to you from Ephesians chapter 4. And if you look at it carefully, Ephesians chapter 4 is all about what you must do. Okay? But we're not going to start there. So I want you to roll your Bibles back to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm just going to start reading to you. And we could go all the way back to chapter 1. Chapter 1 is filled. I mean, this is a, a section that is absolutely jammed with a description of who you were, who I was outside of Christ, and what Christ has done to remedy that. And listen, if you're here this morning and you don't have a personal, vital relationship with Jesus Christ... You, you, you've never confessed your sin to him and him forgiven you and you know you're clean and you, you're going to heaven, right? If you don't have that, then I want to show you where you are and what Christ will do for you. But if you are a Christian, I want, you, I want to remind you of these things just like Paul reminds us, okay? So, so I'm going to just give you a couple things and these are the indicatives, okay? This is what Christ has done and I'll get to the imperatives in a second, okay? So the first thing I want you to see is that we were dead God made us alive. Start reading in in chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once walk in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." Okay, do you hear what he just said? You were spiritually dead, not on life support, not kind of drowning and God threw you a, you know, a, a, a life vest or a, an inner tube or something and then you climbed on. You, you were dead. You were lifeless. You were limp. You were cold. You were unfeeling, unresponding, and Jesus rescued you. You lived your life without reference to God. Now, some of you are going to disagree with me. Oh, no, I've, I've loved God all my life. Well, I'm going to correct you in just a moment. But, here, but just say this. You were disobedient. You were under God's wrath like all of mankind. In other words, you were bound for hell outside of Christ because of your sin. But then look what he says. Look, keep going in verse 4. But God. <laughs> uh, I, I've told people before, someday I'm going to preach a sermon series called The Big Butts of the Bible, and that's a big butt right there, Okay. <laughs> This is huge. This is amazing. But 
God. I mean, the, some of the greatest good news words in the Bible. In his rich mercy and great love made us alive together with Christ. This is what God has done for you. He saved you. He resurrected your spiritually dead spirit. He made you alive. Look at who's doing the work in all of this. God is doing it. Christ does it. You didn't do it. He did it. And it was all by his grace. I mean, see, see, look what he says. He keeps going and he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses sin, he made us alive with Christ by grace you have been saved. Verse six, and raised us up. Okay, again, he's doing it. It, 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 it. And seated us with him in the heavenly places. Why? So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his, uh, uh, of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own it is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. You didn't do it. He did it. Christ saved you. You said, but Chris, I chose him. Yes, you did. But you would have never chosen him had he not resurrected you first. Then you chose. Then you said yes. See, I mean, imagine it this way. Imagine you're, and this is a very poor illustration, but just imagine you're knocked unconscious and you're lying over a, you know, the proverbial railroad and here comes the, the, railroad, the, the, the steam engine just barreling down the track and you're going to die. There's no way out of it. And the man walks by and he sees you there and he sees the thing coming towards you. And the only way that he can rescue you, and you're unconscious, you don't even know the man is there. The only way he can rescue you is he picks you up and throws you off the track and he has to sacrifice himself and he dies. And you wake up later and you discover this is what's happened. Now tell me that you would not live the rest of your life in light of that one episode. And you wouldn't be thinking to yourself, oh, I, I gotta be a good person because of what? No, you'd be like, I get to. I've now been made alive. I should have been dead. And look what he did for me. So then the, this happened to you. If you're a Christian, it happened to you. The man's name was Jesus, right? You were dead. He made you alive. But let's keep going. You were separated, alienated, strangers, hopeless. God brought us near. Okay, let's go down to verse 12. Okay? Remember, okay, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, there's another one. In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, now listen. So, so listen, you may say, I've always walked with Jesus. I've always loved Jesus. I've always known God. No, you haven't. No, 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 you have not. Maybe you've known about Jesus because you're American, right? Maybe you know about God. But if you say anything less, you're calling the Bible and God a liar. He says, no, before he saved you, until the day Christ resurrected you, until the day he entered your life and said, you're mine today, Chris, and pulled you out. I was a stranger, and I was separated, and I was hopeless. Doesn't matter how moral I was. Doesn't matter how good I was. Because Paul's going to say in Romans, anything not of faith is sin. <laughs> He didn't do anything out of faith in God at that point. See, if Jesus has saved you, he has done far more than simply give you a future in heaven. Paul says, but now you've been brought near. And he goes on to say in verse 19, I mean, you're no longer strangers and aliens. You're fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. You see this? You see what he's done? He's brought you near. He's put you in a relationship with Jesus, with God that you didn't have before. He gives you peace. He makes you a citizen in his kingdom. You're just now an alien in this world and a member of his household. And Paul says, remember that. Remember the indicative. Remember what Christ has done for you. Don't race to the commands. We'll get there. First remember, revel in Get saturated in what Christ has done. And then Paul's going to take chapter 3 of Ephesians and basically say, hey, look, 
I just want to glory now in what Christ has done. I mean, this mystery of Christ and how he reconciles us has been hidden for millennia, and now it's manifested in Christ and made known through his church so that, that the body of Christ is a reflection of what Christ has done. He's, he's taken all these variegated, you know, all these various races and things and brought us together and so you can look around the church world and you should see, you know, red, yellow, black, white. We should all be there. And it says that the, the you know, the, the powers of the world look down and they're just, they're just blown away by this. Now, after chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, then, makes sense, right? He gets to chapter four. <laughs> after all that after all, the, the description of what Christ has done, only then does Paul say, here's what you should do in response to that. You see what's happening? Paul goes, look, I don't even want you to focus on what you must do until you first are saturated with what Christ has done. See, this is some of your problem. We don't spend near enough time saturating our hearts, reminding ourselves every day that this is who we are. So now, so now, okay, so then we do get to the imperatives. And so let me start giving you some, some, some imperatives, some commands of what the Bible is going to say we have to do, okay? Number three is live a life worthy of Christ. Okay, let, let's start in chapter 4 and, uh, and, just, and just look at this, okay? Look at chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Okay, so Paul says, I want you to walk in this manner worthy. That's when he says walk, walk is a metaphor for life. And he's going to tell us all throughout Ephesians, there's some people who walk in a worthy way, some who walk in an unworthy way. And over and over, Paul's going to say, this is how you should and should not live in light of what Christ has done. Husbands, you ought to love your wives and lay your life down for them. Because guess what? That's what Christ did. Wives, you ought to submit to your husband the way that church submits to Christ. He looks back to Christ over and over. Masters and slaves, employers, employees, children, all these things, they flow out of the foundation is what Christ has done. And he says, so he starts by walking in a manner worthy of the calling. What's our calling? You've been called by Christ to be his child. He called you out of darkness. And so you walk now worthy of what he's done for you. Okay, so what does that look like? What does it mean to walk worthy? Well, that's, let's go with verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, what, what does walking worthy mean? It means you're humble, means you're gentle, means you're patient, means you're bearing, forbearance, right? It means you're eager for unity. Now, look, we could preach on every one of those words. I won't do that. But look, for our purpose, I want you to notice something. Not one of those things can be done by you alone. You can't do it. Okay, look, here's what I mean by that. These are all attitudes and actions that get flushed out in community, in relationships. Okay, because look, it's, I have no problem when, with unity when it's me. I got no problem with humility. I'm the most humble guy I know when I'm all by myself. I'm patient, no problems. I am gentle with me. Okay? The problem is when you enter my life. Oh, now, now there's friction. Now there's things rubbing against both of us. Oh, 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 now I have to be patient. Now I have to be forgiving. See, see, he says, the only way these things are gonna happen is when you walk in community. And listen, by the way, not just any community. This isn't just about, hey, just having friends. He says, when you walk in verse two, he tells us that it's the one another's. Who are the one another's? It's us. It's the body of Christ. It's the people of God. It's Christians. In other words, it's with the people of God, walking in community with the people of God, the, and for your purposes, the people of Foothill Church, the people you, you run with, right, that, that that's where all this happens. Now, now step back for a minute and, and just remember something. The flow of Paul's argument is basically this, okay? Chapters 1 through 3, 
all that Christ has done for you. Chapters 4 through 6, how you should live in light of that. Put it another way, chapter, turn it around, chapters 4 through 6, the motivation for doing what you're called to do, chapter 4 through 6, is what Christ has already done for you, chapters 1 through 3. And remembering that, calling it to mind. This is why it's a discipline of the Christian life. You understand this to remember? You understand that we, we do our, our Lord's Supper every week so you'll remember, not just get a refreshment at the end of service. <laughs> See, Paul expects that one of the chief byproducts of being saved by God and put into his family is that we will live in community with that family. Okay, but apparently that doesn't come naturally. Ever thought about this? It just doesn't. Apparently, that's really hard. And you know why I say that? Because it requires humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another and an eagerness for unity. This is not natural. It's supernatural. Right? And the only place you're going to get that power is through Christ in you, the Holy Spirit, and you remembering what Christ has done. So, I mean, just, just ask yourself, am I eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace with other believers? Did you get out of bed this morning? I'm going to church. I'm really eager for unity. Is that what you're eager for? Or coffee or a friend or whatever, right? <laughs> I'm, are you eager to maintain the unity or did you even give it a second thought? No, what I'm eager to is to vent my opinion. See, we think, we only think of unity and patience. The only time these things ever come up is when we're walking and living life with one another, other Christians. And it's there the gospel is lived out. It's in community that I learn what it looks like for me to walk worthy of Christ. I don't learn it on my own. This is not a just Jesus and me thing. Right? Our modern American individualistic, radical individualism in Christianity is totally unbiblical. See, Jesus was humble. He was gentle. He was so patient. And he was forbearing. And he was so eager for unity that he died on a cross. I mean, remember John 17, Lord, make them one even as you and I are one. I'm going to go to the cross for this. See, if, if you don't remember the gospel, your Christianity will be a bunch of rules and regulations, a list of do's and don'ts. See, and, and truthfully, you know what you'll do? You, you'll punt. I, I can't tell you how many people in the last nearly six years of my being here at Foothill Church have come into Foothill Church so excited. Oh, we love this church. It's a great church. You know, we love the worship, whatever. And they, they go crazy over it. And then it'll be, I don't know, you know, six months, a year later. Hey, where's that person that was crazy about? I don't know. They disappeared. I'll wager that what happened is they realize, oh, wait, it doesn't come naturally anymore. I have to be humble and forgiving and forbear in love and seek unity. I, I don't want to do that. That's too hard. So, you know, I'll just do what most of our San Gabriel Valley culture does. I'll just bounce from this church to that church to this church. Kind of like a little ecclesiological buffet around here. And I like their worship and I like their children's program. I like the youth program there. I like the preaching over here, whatever. And you'll, you'll never get to a place where God is rubbing and there's friction against you where you've got to go, I got to deal with this because you run. Right? We are in a culture of runners. <laughs> so, so we walk worthy of Christ. Second thing Paul's going to tell us, and again, I don't have time to unpack this whole passage to you, but second thing I want you to see is he tells, us, tells you you, you, to build up the body of Christ. Okay, look at this. Skip down to verse 11. Just follow the logic of what he's doing here, okay? And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, okay, church officers, whatever you want to call that. Why? To equip the saints. Why? 
for the work of the ministry. Why? For building up the body of Christ. Let me say it to you this way. Pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets, whatever, don't do the work of the ministry. They equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's my job. My job is to equip you, right? So that your spiritual maturity comes in succession from Christ to these church leaders to you. Now, here's the thing. You may say, I don't like that. You know, um, uh, I'm not going to live by that. Well, okay, fine. You don't have to believe that, but here, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to stand before God someday, and so are you. What God's going to say to me is, Chris, did you equip the saints? Okay, now, now I'm going to be held accountable for that, if, whether I did or did not. I preached your word. I mean, whatever my justification is going to be. God, that's what I'm... Then he's going to look at you and say, did you do the work of the ministry? Well, I thought that was the pastor's job. No. That's your job. That's your job. And I'm not going to hold Chris accountable for that. See, see and then he tells us what's going to happen Okay, so we, we work together, right? There's this, there's this building up and, and there, there, there's the, the equipping which leads to the work of the ministry, the building up the body of Christ and look what happens until we all attain to the unity of the faith the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See what happens? So, so you do the work of the ministry and, and then and, and we're ministering to, to the church, we're ministering to each other, and what happens is there's a mature manhood what are, you know, th that, that looks more and more like Christ. So the pastoral staff doesn't do all the work. I know some of you think we pay you, you do it. We equip you. You do the work of helping people grow in spiritual maturity. It's from the work of the ministry by you that the body is built up. God's pattern for producing people with powerful faith and love and endurance and maturity isn't just pastors and teachers. It's you. You have to get this. So how does that happen? How do we produce that kind of thing within the church? I mean, is it sufficient? Let's just gather on Saturday night or Sunday morning for an hour and 50 minutes, listen to a message and leave. Is this what Paul had in mind? Is that gonna build us up to mature manhood? No. See, look it. You know what will happen? It'll happen when this breaks down into smaller units. When you start walking with other believers in community, when you start being, we start being intentional to bring about what Paul says will happen here. At Foothill Church, we call these home groups. See, and let me, let me just say it this way, and I want to prove this to you from Scripture. Your spiritual life depends on a small group. That is not an over-exaggeration. I want to show you from Scripture that you cannot, will not do it alone. Okay, I'm going to read you a bunch of Scriptures. You can jot them down. You can check, see if I was telling you the right thing later on. But I'm just going to go through this fast, okay? Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Okay, how many stories do you know of where people fooled themselves into believing that their way was right? I can do this. Nobody else is speaking in my life. The only voice they heard was their own. The loudest voice in their universe was them. These are usually people that you're like, I heard from God too, right? Oh, I, oh God talks to me. And then they're devastated when they heard wrongs. They never bounced it off of anybody. And so what do we do? We follow our own inclinations. We do the Disney thing and follow our hearts everywhere we go, right? Where we do the American Idol thing. Hey, I know I lost, but I was true to myself. <laughs> and the Bible says if you're true to yourself and you follow your heart, you'll die. Because your heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so he says, look, it, 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 it seems right to you. But in the end, it leads to death. Because nobody else spoke into your life. There was no, you didn't even allow room for that. Hebrews chapter 3, the writer says this in verse 12 and 13. Take care, brothers. Listen to this. Lest there be in you, in any of you, 
an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, this happens all the time, right? People are deceived. I'm deceived by the attractiveness of sin. Your heart becomes hardened because you like this and you start to sort of move away from God. And maybe it's happened to some of you. I had this great traction, you know, in my life spiritually, and it just doesn't seem to be there anymore. And if I look back, I see there's this deceitfulness of sin that's caught me up into it. And look at, and so scripture says, you know what the remedy to that is? One another. It doesn't say take care pastors to exhort people daily. You know, do a blog so that people can be exhorted every day because you're only there once a week. It says take care brothers, sisters, See how this works? Pastors equip, saints do the work of ministry. And listen, here's the amazing thing. What Hebrews just told us is that part of the work of exhorting one another, this is amazing. Part of your job is to be God's instrument in the preservation of someone else's faith. Right? Do you understand this? The preservation of your faith isn't just your problem, it's my problem. The preservation of my faith is not just my problem, it's your problem. It's the problem of those we're walking with. How can this happen in a room of 200 people? It doesn't. There's nobody, no, nobody knows. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There it is again. Now, how does this happen? How do you encourage, stir up one another for love and good works? Look, I, I believe in what's happening in this room right now. You have to know if you've been here any length of time. I believe in preaching. Right? I think, I think pre we, we must have it. I just don't believe it's enough. I believe you have to do something with it. And listen, love and good works are not easy to stir up in a group this size. But you know what happens? It happens when there's people you're accountable to and you're walking with and they're stirring and you're, you're, you're listening to each other and you're saying, yeah, come on, keep going, keep going. You need people who are close to you and helping you make that happen. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Isn't it interesting that when you're walking in community, Ecclesiastes says if he falls, but if you're alone when he falls. Now here's what I think. For most people, we're going to fall. We're going to fall. I'm going to fall. And it's difficult to get back up when you're alone. So Solomon says, look, it's better that you're walking closely with a brother or sister. It's better because when you fall, the other's there to pick you up. Get back on the horse, right? And look, it's possible, it's possible for you to come to church faithfully, right? To sing songs, to take communion, to listen to a sermon, take notes, and be totally alone. And if you do that, and if that's the way you live your spiritual life, you will be surrounded by Christians and be totally alone when you fall. And chances are, you'll blame the church. Somewhere out there, you'll be talking and saying, you know, that Foothill Church doesn't love anybody because I fell and nobody did anything. You're right, because we didn't know. Could we? Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, this doesn't just happen by coming to church. <laughs> I can't bear your burdens right now. I don't even know what they are. Paul doesn't say, have your burdens eased through preaching. He makes it personal. He makes every Christian responsible. I'm responsible to carry your burdens. You're responsible to carry mine. And one of the great benefits of kingdom living is that no one should have to carry a, a crushing burden alone. <laughs> You shouldn't. 
So in order to fulfill the law of Christ, we have to have close, trusting relationships with other strong, mature believers. Otherwise, how can we bear one another's burdens? And the answer is we can't. James 5, 16, let me give you another one. Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay, look it. Notice it didn't say confess your sins to a pastor or a priest. No, it says to one another. And I can guarantee that hasn't happened this morning. You know, Chadwick went, hey, 60 seconds, greet your neighbor. I looked at porn. Uh... I sinned against my wife, right? I got angry. No, you're like, hey, what's going on? Let's, you know, let's talk about the weather. Good to see you. Fine, 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 fine. <laughs> right? You're not confessing. Your, the, the, when, and seriously, when's the last time you've been in an environment where you confess sin? Right? Aren't, aren't our prayer meetings usually like, you know, pray for my Aunt Bessie's goiter. It's getting out of hand, right? <laughs> I don't want to pray about me. I want to pray about some distant rel relative of mine. I mean, seriously. When have you been when you said, I got this sin and I hate it? Because confessing sin isn't about authenticity. Like you get in these, some of you, you know, get in these like, well, let me tell you about my sin. Well, I got a bigger one than that. Well, let me tell you. About Listen, if that's your motive, I'm just trying to be authentic. I have no, no, no intention of doing anything about this. I'm just confessing it. No, the goal of confession is healing. The goal of confession is to say, I hate this. Please pray for me. See, this is how God grows people spiritually. He doesn't do it outside of relationships. And if you're serious, you're like, man, I want to do this. I want to grow. I want to be a mature man, a mature woman. Then look, you're not going to do alone. I mean, the very beginning of the Bible, it's not good for a man to be alone. I believe that's marriage, but I believe that's more than marriage. God built us for community. And it's not just a nice additive to your life. It's not just a program we're going to ask you to be a part of. It's not just another weekly obligation. It's the difference between mature manhood and stability or childish faith and, and something that is constantly in flux. The earth is shifting beneath you. I mean, look it. Let me show you what I mean. Go, go to verse 14 of, of chapter 4 uh, of chapter four of Ephesians. This is where Paul kind of brings it to a conclusion. Why all this happening? Why walking with each other like this? Why building each other up to mature manhood? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who, who is the head into Christ. You see this? That's the goal. That's what's happening. That's what gets produced. So, so, okay, let me give you one last imperative because the truth of the matter is I do want you to do something very concrete this morning. And maybe you'd say, how are you guys facilitating that at Foothill Church? Well, we're facilitating through what we call our home groups, right? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to join a home group. Okay, I've made the case for why this is necessary for you spiritually. So let me just really quickly, how do you do it? Okay, Stephen told you. You grab this thing, there are, there are home groups of all ages and stripes and you know, kids and no kids and you know, empty nesters and you know, college students and, and there's specialty groups in the back. I'm leading one. I'm going to lead a men's leadership group. Guys, that you're saying, man, I want to be a leader in my home. I want to be a leader at the church. I want to be a leader in my life. I want to know what that looks like to be a man of God. You can sign up for that. So here's what you do. Take your little connection card. You write the number of the home group on it. Drop it in the offering bucket. You're done. It's a one-stop shop, okay? I mean, you, you, you do it, and we'll, we'll call you this week. We'll, we'll, we'll email you this week. You give us your information, your name, and give us an email that actually works and a way to get a hold of you, okay? And you do this, okay? Who, who, who are these home group leaders that you'd be asked to be a part? Well, look around. They're all wearing orange shirts in this service, and, uh, and they're here to talk to you. Um, where are they happening? They happen in, uh, basically in, our, in, our home, in, in host homes, all from, I mean, from Rancho to Pasadena. I mean, everywhere in between. So how long do I have to, this is like till Jesus comes, Chris? No, just, just, just nine weeks, right? We do three kind of quarters, get people together. You can be in the same one all three quarters if you want to. But these are going to start on September 22nd. 
nine weeks. So if you call me up and say, hey, I hit my home group, I'm going to say, got eight more weeks. You know what else I'll say? Why? Why? Because God is asking you to be humble and gentle and forbearing. And you find you have to actually try to be eager for the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Then maybe you're not in the wrong home group at all. Maybe you're in exactly the place God wants you. Where else is this going to happen in your life? Because we run from every kind of pressure and pain. See, so don't, don't, don't sit on the curb. Don't punt. Spiritual maturity is work. Being in community is work. Following the commands of God is work. Doing the work of ministry is, by definition, work. But it's joyful work. And you know why it's joyful work? Because you look and you remember, Jesus saved me. Jesus is doing something in me. Jesus isn't wasting one bit of effort in my life. Jesus raised me from the dead. Jesus rescued me from the wrath of God. Jesus put me into a new family. Listen, I stay focused on that. I'm going to see God produce things in me that never would have been producing me outside of this. And Jesus will give me everything I need. It's not good for man to be alone. In fact, it's deadly. Let's pray.